Hello, so I'm going to tell the story of uh, my second cousin, four times removed, uh, Maud Hunt Squire. Um, so this is the family tree, uh, which is a simplified version for the purposes of this. But um, our common ancestor is Richard Squire, who lived in the village of Chiddock in Dorset in the late 1700s. Uh, there's more children off this and other lines, but I've toned it down just for the simplicity. So I'm down here, and my dad and my nan, and then what what we called uh, Auntie Joan, or who we called Auntie Joan, uh, who lived in Chiddock. And I remember when we were children going to visit her and her cottage there. Uh, and then over here, we've got uh, Simon Squire, who was one of Richard Squire's children, the last one. And then his son, Alfred Squire, who was born in 1829. And he emigrated to the, the USA in 1849. Uh, he had two marriages, uh, the second of which was to Hannah Hunt, and then they had three children. Uh, Maud Hunt Squire was the, the one in the middle, and then William Horace, her brother, had a, had a daughter called Dorothy, who was Maud's niece, and she's also met Joan, because my dad recollects hearing about her meeting to find out about family history uh, quite a while ago, because she died in... Uh, the mid 90s, so it's a little while ago. So, so Chiddock is a, a sort of village uh, in between Dorchester and uh, Lyme Regis on the Jurassic Coast in Dorset in England. And we think that um, Simon Squire, who was Alfred Squire's father, might have lived in one of these cottages uh, in Chiddock. Um, it's hard to tell from the census exactly where they are because addresses in those days weren't quite as uh, useful as they are today in terms of knowing where they are but um, it's a very quaint village sort of on the main east west coast road uh, lots of thatched cottages and yeah so he he may have lived there at some point and Alfred probably grew up in this sort of area here so <clears throat> in 1849 uh, Alfred emigrated to America on a ship which went from Liverpool to New Orleans, uh, which seems like a slightly longer way around, but uh, not sure. Not sure that the information about how or why he, he left, he might have wanted new opportunities and there was some incentive to go to America probably at that time, but he ended up in Cincinnati um, in Ohio and um, the same year he arrived, he, um, he opened a music shop. Uh, this is Cincinnati map. Uh, his, uh, his, um, his music shop was on Elm Street, which is this road that runs through here. But having looked at the map, it's this end of the, of the, of the, of the road was obviously demolished. There's a American football stadium and a big car park and a, and a, and a main road put through. So it would have been somewhere along this section down by the river. Um, but here's his shop, uh, some adverts uh, from the sort of uh, late 1800s and, uh, and an inscription, A Squire Cincinnati, Ohio. And um, so I don't know, he, he obviously imported brass instruments in particular from Europe and sold them in the US. Um, but he was an accomplished musician himself. I think he was, he played the violin and probably brass instruments as well. And yeah, he, he was, he fought in the uh, American Civil War on the Union side, um, but probably as a bandsman, he was a bit older at that stage. So, but he, he wrote lots of sheet music, which he sold at his um, shop as well. And I keep finding various sort of things every time I search for him that pop up to do with music and uh, and stuff. So there's more to find out about him, that's for sure. So Maud was born in 1873. As I said, she was the middle child of three. Um, seen here at school in 1849 in Maud and then in 1889, age 16. So she's you know pretty well dressed <laughs> for that age. Lots of hats. 
and and this is more than Alfred Squire a uh, photograph taken in 1889 by her brother William. Uh, so her brother William uh, sort of became an engineer and worked, worked for the Hotchkiss company that uh, made a mixture of armaments and vehicles. So I, he, we found that he's got patents on various machine gun parts and I think eventually moved to Paris and worked at their factory in Saint-Denis there and may have been an arms salesman in the uh, early 1900s. Um, but again, not sure. Um, but yeah, so this is this is her. This is the only photograph we've got of, of Alfred that I, I've currently found. But um, yeah, he obviously did quite well for himself with, with his shop. And this is a photograph of Maud in 1893, probably one of the few sort of formal portraits that was taken of her. Um, so she enrolled in the Cincinnati Art Academy in 1894 and was there till 1898. And this is what it looks like now, although the building has probably looked fairly similar um, from that time through to now. Obviously old trams and stuff. And it was at Cincinnati Art Academy where she met Ethel Mars around 1895. They're in the same class together. And this is Ethel Mars here with, I think, a mother and her aunt and then in their home. And she grew up in Springfield, Illinois. Um, but yeah, it looks quite a nice decorative house, lots of nice paintings and carpets and stuff. So uh, yeah, it's a nice, nice old house. And so this is a class photograph in 1897 and uh, it was Professor L.H. Meekin's class. And he was a, a Geordie uh, landscape painter who went over to America and, and ended up teaching at Cincinnati Art Academy uh, in the late 1800s. But he was a sort of, uh, you know, well-known, well-regarded artist in his own right at that time. And there was also um, Frank Duvenek, who was the, um, the head of the uh, Cincinnati Art Academy he was there at that point in time as well. So I think both of them met, uh, certainly them and were influenced by their work and stuff. And so uh, this is Ethel Mars at the back here with Maud Hunt Squire next to her. And then at the front here is uh, Edna Bowes Hopkins and she, she appears in the story a few times uh, as we go through. Um, so, uh, Mohan Squire and Ethel Mars, and this is this is them outside Ethel Mars's grandparents' house in Springfield, Illinois, in about 1898. And from meeting at college, they would then spend the rest of their life together and travel and uh, work together. So, after, <clears throat> after graduation from Cincinnati Art Academy, they both moved to New York and were hired as book illustrators and this is an example of one of the books that they illustrated, uh, Robert uh, Louis Stevenson, Child, Child's Garden of Verses. Um, but yeah, there's some lovely illustrations in this book. And luckily my dad found a copy of this somewhere, probably on eBay. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's just some nice, uh, nice illustrations from that period. And so this is Maud in 1900, and then the pair of them together at Staten Island in 1901. So yeah, they were in New York for a few years, I think, um, where they were working on various book illustrations, but yeah, they were very, very stylish ladies and liked to be well-dressed. So from sort of the early 1900s, they traveled over to Europe probably several times uh, visiting various exhibitions and sort of, I guess, following in the footsteps of their tutors who had who'd previously been to Europe and have been to various exhibitions with big, you know, well-known painters and stuff. So they were getting connected over there. And I think by that stage, uh, Maud's brother, William, <clears throat> was living in Paris already. So he may have already had contacts for them uh, when they when they were sort of visited and stuff, but um, this is a photograph of the Quartz Ball in Paris in 1902, and this is Maud here, and then Ethel Miles sat behind on the floor by the looks of it. 
I'm not sure whether there's anyone else in this photograph of significance. I've got no information about who any of them are or whether they're relevant to the story, but yeah, they were obviously um, getting into the society over there at that time. So probably when they came back, um, Cincinnati Art, Art, Art Museum um, had a couple of exhibitions in 1903 with their book illustrations and then 1904 uh, with paintings, drawings, and other color prints. Um, so this is quite a big art museum that's been there for a long time in the park in Cincinnati. Uh, so this is probably one of their sort of earlier sort of uh, solo exhibitions. Um, but by 1905, the pair had moved to Paris um, and eventually settled and lived in 39 Boulevard St. Jack. Um, and just up the up a few doors, uh, Ed, Edna Bois Hopkins and her husband James Hopkins lived at number fifty four. Uh, uh, yeah, and um, so this is this is an example of some of Maud's color etchings between nineteen eighty seven and nineteen thirteen. So there's lots of Parisian cafe scenes and uh, people going about their work and business, and uh, yeah, so it just captures the the scenes that they saw in, in early Paris in the 1900s. And then this is some examples of Ethel Mars's uh, colour woodblock prints in 1903 to 1908. Again, sort of lots of scenes around Paris and the cafes and people going around about the street and yeah, just some nice colourful images of uh, a Paris life. Yeah, as I say, Edna Bose Hopkins, she lived at well, 51 Boulevard St. Jacques, which was up the road. <clears throat> and she was also a printer uh, as well as uh, as the other two, and certainly worked more so with, with Ethel Miles on different print techniques. And I think they both taught print techniques to others as well. Um, but yeah, they, they were obviously friends from when they were at college together. And so this is a map of Paris and around yeah, 1907, they were, they were living at Boulevard St. Jacques, which is down here. And then up here is 27 Rue de Flores, which it, I'm sure it might ring a bell with some people, but it was the, the home of Gertrude Stein, who was a prominent sort of person at that time. She was an American novelist, poet, playwright, and art collector with her brother, Leo. Um, but yeah, she was she was sort of the hub of the artistic um, sort of community at that stage, and this is uh, this is the in inside of her salon, as it was called. And um, so up here is the there's a portrait by Picasso of uh, Gertrude Stein. But they would they collected quite a few artists, uh, including Cezanne and uh, Matisse and various others. Um, but yeah, she would she would hold uh, Saturday salons in after uh, um, sort of artists just turning up. She decided to have an actual event uh, every Saturday where people would turn up, talk about art, critique each other's work, and possibly like try and get gain more for her collection. I'm not sure whether they sold art through through people as well, but it was a it was a, a melting pot of uh, artists and writers at, at that stage obviously including Picasso and his Hemingway and Matisse and Scott Fitzgerald and various other artists would come and go and I got a, an extract from um, Gertrude Stein's later sort of uh, autobiography uh, which I'll just read out a section because it's sort of uh, gives a hint of sort of what was what was going on on these evenings, but also actually mentions uh, Ethel Miles and, and, uh, and Maud Hunt Squire. So I'll just quickly read out a section of this. Uh, so it's part, it's from the autobiography of Alice B. Toklas, who was the partner of uh, Gertrude Stein. And although it's written by Gertrude Stein, it's written in the voice of Alice. Um, so it sort of uses her name in the third person. So, so the room was soon very, very full. And who were they all? 
groups of Hungarian painters and writers. It happened that some Hungarian had once been brought and the word had spread from him throughout all Hungary. Any village where there was a young man who had ambition, ambitions heard of 27 Rue de Flores. And then he lived but to get there and a great many did get there. They were always there, all sizes and shapes, all degrees of wealth and poverty, some very charming, some very rough, and every now and then a very beautiful young peasant. Then there were quantities of Germans, not too popular because they tended always to want to see everything that was put away and they tended to break things. And Gertrude Stein had a weakness for breakable objects. She has a horror of people who collect only the unbreakable. And then there was the fair sprinkling of Americans. Mildred Aldrich would bring a group or Sayen, the electrician or some painter and occasionally an architectural student would accidentally get there. And then there were, were the hab habitues, among them Miss, Miss Mars and Miss Squires, whom Gertrude Stein afterwards immortalized in her story of Miss Fur and Miss Skeen. On that first night, Miss Mars and I talked of a subject then entirely new, how to make up your face. She was interested in types. She knew that there were femme decorative, femme de interior, which is described as house, housewives or house, homemakers, uh, and femme intrigante, which is intriguing females. <laughs> Um, there was no doubt that Fernand Picasso was a femme decorative, and, uh, but what was Madame Matisse? Femme d'interior, I said, and she was very pleased. From, from time to time, one heard the high Spanish whinnying laugh of Picasso and gay con contralto outbreak of Gertrude Stein. People came and went in and out. Miss Stein told me to sit with Fernand and Fernand was always beautiful, but heavy in hand. I sat, it was my first sitting with the wife of a genius. So I don't think Fernand was actually married to Picasso, but he was. she was certainly um, one of his uh, various lovers at the time and, and muses who he painted. But um, yeah, it's quite nice that it just sort of places them in a room with Picasso and his partner at the time. Um, so yeah, I found that only the other day. Uh, so yeah, as, as she was said in there, Gertrude Stein writes a word portrait, Miss Fur and Miss Skeen, in about 1908 to 1911, about Ethel Mars and Maud Hunt Squire, but it wasn't published until 1922, and when this book, Geography and Plays, was, uh, was published, and it was then also published in full in Vanity Fair in 1923, in the July edition. And I will briefly read out an extract of this, but it's a slightly bizarre piece of writing. But um, so here we go. Uh, Helen Fur had quite a pleasant home. Miss Fur was quite a pleasant woman. Mr. Fur was quite a pleasant man. Helen Fur had quite a pleasant voice, a voice quite worth cultivating. She did not mind working. She worked to cultivate her voice. She did not find it gay living in the same place where she had always been living. She went to a place where some were cultivating something, voices and other things needing cultivating. She met Georgine Skeen there who was cultivating her voice, which some thought was qu quite a pleasant one. Helen Fur and Georgine Skeen lived together then. Georgine Skeen liked traveling. Helen Fur did not care about traveling. She liked to stay in one place and be gay there. They were together then and traveled to another place and stayed there and were gay there. They stayed there, they were gay there, not very gay there, just gay there. They were both gay there. They were regularly working there, both of them cultivating their voices there. They were both gay there. Georgine Skeen was gay there and she was regular, regular in being gay regular in not being gay, regular in being a gay one, who was one not being gay, longer than was needed to be one being quite a gay one. <laughs> they were both gay there, there, and both working there then. So yeah, there's a 
there's, there's more of that, but it, it's quite confusing to read. Um, so there's a lot of debate about whether the use of the word gay just means happy and, and light and, and that kind of thing, which was what the word was sort of known for at that time, or whether it did refer to sort of homosexuals at that time. I mean, uh, Gertrude Stein was obviously a lesbian within a couple with, with Alice and, and obviously Maud and, and um, Ethel were probably as well. So I don't know whether it was sort of an in-joke between the, the, the group there that they were sort of writing about that at that time, but it is if it is sort of talking about the, using the word gay as to sort of mean homosexual, it is the first sort of literary sort of uh, writing of that in that in that regard so I think there's yeah still a lot of debate as to what the actual meaning of it is but it's it's a fair chance that it is <laughs> anyway uh, let's move on and so yeah here's um here's some of Ethel Mars's uh, woodblock color prints from sort of 1909 to 1913 and um yeah I think the process of woodblock uh, making was quite a sort of complicated process and involved lots of heavy pieces of wood. Now I don't know whether they had a studio somewhere in Paris that they worked or with other artists or on their own, I'm not quite sure, but um, it would have been a lot of uh, sort of weighty pieces of wood to transport around, uh, which, you know, in those days there wasn't so many cars to like transport that stuff around in and stuff. So. Yeah, it, it's, it sort of shows the sort of level of sort of um, work that they were doing at the time. Um, but yeah, it's a very colourful sort of bold work, uh, and very modern in appearance at that time, I think. So Maud was probably working more so on commercial book illustrations sort of up, in, up until World War One, And I think often sort of travelled backwards and forwards to uh, certainly New York to meet publishers and stuff. So this is a couple of other examples of uh, illustrations that she'd done in that sort of time. I think the, the one on the, um, the right is from uh, Jason and the Argonauts, uh, one of the various illustrations from that book. Um, so at the outbreak of World War One in 1914, they both moved back to the United States. Um, and I think firstly, they sort of stayed with Ethel Barthes' family in Springfield, uh, possibly briefly lived in Chicago and then ended up settling over here in Provincetown um, on Cape Cod, which is sort of off the coast of Boston in Massachusetts. Uh, Provincetown is, and still is a, a sort of quite a bustling, uh, artists community, um, very liberal in its views, I think. Um, my parents have visited and said it was an interesting place to me. <laughs> um, but they they lived in a few places uh, whilst they were here, but certainly uh, we've got records that show that they lived at 37 Commercial Street in Provincetown, which was on the, on the coast. Um, and so, yeah, this is uh, Maud Hunt's choir outside that house, we think. Uh, my parents, when they visited, managed to go and see this house, the the thirty seven Commercial Street, and had a had a look round. I mean, it's 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 potentially the same plot, whether or not it's been rebuilt entirely or modified. Uh, it certainly looks like it's got elements of the same bit, but in in modified form. So I don't know whether it's entirely the same, but or you know any of it at all. But um, yeah, they lived there and worked for the duration of, of World War I. And this is my mum at the Provincetown Art Association and Museum with one of Maud's prints, although it's a Parisian print rather than one of the ones that she did while she was there. Um, so yeah, this is, this is Maud and then Ethel. By this stage, they're in their 40s whilst they're there. And this is um, Ethel here, and I think Maud there with various other people. I'm not sure exactly who they are. But um, yeah, so they, they stayed there and were part of the Province Town Printers Group. Um, and this is some of the other artists that were involved at that stage. And I think in 1915 was like the, the heyday of this uh, group and their developments of. Uh, woodblock prints and woodcut prints. 
And they, this, where is he? This guy here, his uh, Brora Julius Olsen Nordfeldt. He was sort of, I think one of the sort of key people in sort of developing the woodcut prints from Japanese techniques. And then others sort of also started uh, using that style. Um, and obviously that Edna Bears Hopkins pops up again here. Um, and so, yeah, it was quite a, quite a big sort of community of artists uh, living and working around this, this area at the time. But um, yeah, it's one of the, one of the other sort of um, big things that they got involved with whilst they were there. And so this is some examples of Maud's woodblock prints from Provincetown in the sort of 1917 to 1919 period. So obviously the subject matters changed from their freezing days and they're doing pictures of uh, fishermen and people bathing and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's just some really nice, beautiful images of, uh, of that time and definitely sort of more expressionist than um, and some of the sort of other pictures. Uh, and then, yeah, this is this is Ethel's white line woodcut prints uh, from the similar sort of time. And this is this was the technique that they sort of developed as part of the province town printmakers. So that instead of having lots of different blocks to make up an image, they would do one big block and then carve carve the image out, which gives which leaves the white line around um, certain ele elements of the, the picture. Um, but again, so nice use of bright colours and, and that kind of thing. So yeah. Um, so by by 1921, they they left Provincetown and uh, sailed back to France. And I've seen the list of manifests. So they were on this ship in 1921, uh, heading back to France after the after the First World War and after they yeah, they obviously left it a few few years afterwards to go back. Um, and so once they arrived in France, I think after a while of traveling around a bit, they um, they eventually settled in Vence in south of France, which is close to Nice and was Caen as well. So they're on the Côte d'Azur. And that was a big draw at the time, I think, for various artists. We've got Henri Matisse uh, living in Nice and Pablo Picasso also living in that area, as well as Marc Chagall and uh, various other writers, artists and, and, and that kind of thing. So it was definitely a big hub at the time for artists. Um, and so in, in Vance itself, there was uh, an artist com colony and uh, these were some of the artists that were involved there. And so Ada Gilmore, uh, Chaffe and Oliver, they, they were both um, in Provincetown as well, so they knew them from there. And a couple of others were probably just passing through it and maybe have visited in during, during summers and stuff. But um, there was quite a lot of uh, people working together and, and just generally, uh, yeah, doing their art in this in this area at, at the time. And uh, yeah, and as I said before, yeah, Mark Chagall was living certainly in Vance and then St Paul de Vance, which is another medieval walled town just down the valley a bit. Uh, and so they they were sort of friends and knew him. And this picture on the on the right is. Uh, I think called Lovers of Vance uh, from that sort of period as well. So yeah, they're obviously mixing in, in circles with other well-known artists. Uh, and so this is Maud's work. Um, I think the pair of them by this stage had, had sort of given up with the woodblock printing and were doing more sort of uh, watercolour and illustrations uh, and uh, other types of prints that were easier to deal with rather than big lumps of wood um, but obviously reflecting the scenes that they saw in the south of France and uh, cafe scenes and beach scenes and and the sort of lively goings on of the, the south of France at that point in time and there's a few more here sort of roughly from 1928 period so it's bathers on the beach and people in cafes and, and that kind of thing but yeah different styles and then um this is some of Ethel's gouache drawings from the mid twenties, again, sort of reflecting the, the local scenes in that part of the world. Uh, it does look like a nice place 
and uh, one place that I want to go to at some point in time. Um, and yeah, so by 1929, they'd uh, had a villa built in Vance together and um, it was named La Farigoule. And apparently, according to a French friend, it's, it's potentially named after a uh, Provencal um, thyme-based liqueur that's from that sort of region, um, which apparently has uh, medicinal and uh, stimulating properties. So it'd be interesting to try that at some point. So I don't know whether it, it is named after that, but it certainly potentially could have been and they may have drunk it and enjoyed it. <laughs> And so this is some pictures of uh, Morden Ethel during the 1930s. Um, they had a car which they named Gaston, which they would travel around the south of France and also visited Paris on various occasions. And uh, yeah, there's pictures of them with other people who I'm not sure who they are, but they've got various kittens and dogs and pets and stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, there's a, I've got a couple of, um, descriptions of uh, of uh, the pair of them written by uh, Dorothy, who was uh, Maud's uh, niece, uh, which I'll read out to you now because it sort of gives a hint of what they were like as, as uh, people. Uh, so Dorothy's sort of uh, recollection of her aunt was, uh, she, she was what I call stylish, as well as for her dressing as for her manners. One knew at once that she was a lady, but she was not for ruffles and ribbons and what some people call luxury. She liked what is harmonious. Her jewels had to be artistic rather than real. Some of her bracelets were any brass and a quartz shining on a ring made her happy as, as if it was a diamond. She was not for money either. She had enough to lead her own life and did not enjoy extravagance. And then she's also written a, a description of Ethel Mars as well. So she said, Ethel Mars was a kind of a gypsy. She wore long earrings and had half a dozen bracelets around each arm, ringing when she moved. To dress, she never followed the fashion, but only her own personal style. A summer dress in the winter, as if it was, if it was warm enough, and usually the same little felt hat of which she changed the trimming a flower or a feather, or then in hot weather, a little flat straw hat, Chinese style with a ribbon under her chin. After, after her daily marketing, Ethel sat at the cafe under the trees, drinking her Coca-Cola to watch the people go by or to have a chat with those she knew and sit at her table to take her cup of coffee. And when she came back home from lunch, first thing she'd howl on the doorstep, I've got some fine news, and she'd be telling all the village gossip. So I think, yeah, I think um, Ethel was probably the sort of slightly more outgoing and flamboyant one of, of the pair of them. And I think by the sort of 1930s, um, Maud had stopped uh, making artwork and was starting to become a bit frailer. So I think, Obviously, uh, Ethel was out and about and finding out what was going on locally and uh, recalling it to, to Maud when she came home. And so during the outbreak of Second World War, um, Maud and Ethel had to go into hiding and relocate uh, to a small village called Gonsalon, which is up a valley north of Grenoble, up in the, the edge of the French Alps. Uh, they stayed there living in a hotel uh, throughout the, the war and um, Dorothy, who was more Denise, lived in Switzerland and there's, there's a sort of an account where they had to get money from their American accounts via Dorothy through Switzerland and then somehow get it to them whilst they were living there. But I'm not sure the, the exact circumstances of how they managed to get it there, whether the, someone took it there through the mountains or quite what, but um, be interesting to find out how that happened. And so, yeah, so I said more, more to stop working, but Ethel continued through the 1940s. And these were some of the, the paintings and illustrations that she did during the war. Um, obviously a slightly more somber mood than previously and, and, and stuff, but 
there were little hints of sort of patriotic symbols uh, in these um, these paintings and stuff. So, you know, the red, white, and blue of the the tie and the washing, I think, were sort of hints at, at sort of uh, at that kind of thing. So, so yeah, after the war, uh, they both returned to Vance and um, and lived there. Their their home wasn't affected during the war it wasn't damaged or anything so uh, they were able to come back and live there uh, so this photograph on the left is this is um, a little bit later actually but this is um, this is Ethel Mars sat outside Tony's bar uh, in Vons, Um and I managed to find on Google Street Maps um, the same location so this yellow building on the photograph here is the building they're sat behind uh, this cafe so so yeah, Ethel would have been sat behind this tree somewhere uh, in the sort of mid fifties. Um, but yeah, she obviously uh, was well known in the town at that time and knew, knew lots of people. So Maud Hunt Squire died aged 81 on the 25th of October, 1954. And they'd, they'd spent well over 50 years together living working and traveling and just having a jolly good adventure by the sounds of it. Um, and then Ethel Mars, she, she died in uh, aged 82 in the 23rd of March, 1959. And this photograph of her is taken probably about 1957, but you can see she's still, you know, got her own style, got lots of hats and, and uh, can't quite see the bake up there, but I think she was still, flamboyant in her in her personal you know in her um, makeup and stuff and then this this image uh which they think is potentially a self-portrait of her was done in 1958 um and it was her last artwork that she made and so the pair of them they're buried next to each other in saint paul de Vaughan cemetery um which is the sort of the next town down and Mark Chagall is also buried in that cemetery. But uh, I guess at the time, it was sort of unusual to have two unmarried women buried next to each other. So that's quite a nice, um, a nice sort of monument to them um, being together at that time. And so I think their, their artwork was probably sort of overlooked somewhat because of the people that they were sort of contemporaries of at that time, obviously Picasso and Matisse and, and, and that sort of level of artists are, are, are massive. And, and so they probably got very overlooked at that stage. But in 2000, there was an exhibition at the Mary Ryan Gallery in New York, which uh, sort of uh, looked back at their work and their lives. And um, it's where I've got the exhibition catalog, which is where a lot of the information we found has come from for, for this and uh, what we know about them. But um, yeah, I, there's, there's a nice sort of um, piece written at the end, um, which um, sort of sums up their lives together. Um, so looking, looking back with a hundred years of distance, we can only begin to imagine how talented, determined and adventurous Ethel Mars and Maud Hunt Squire must have been. Coming from Midwestern families, Mars is of very modest financial means. They left home at a young age and attended one of the top art schools in the United States, where though they were women, they were among the best students. Throughout their lives, they sought out the most exciting artistic milieus wherever they were, were to be found. Whether near Gert Gertrude Stein in 1906, Provincetown in the great summer of 1915, or along the south of France in the 1920s, even in the midst of two world wars. Mars's heir described Ethel Mars and Maud Hunt Squire as tres complementaires, and so they were. So I think that's a nice sort of uh, summation of, of their lives together, really. And, um, and yes, well, thank you for listening. And I hope you find this interesting. And if anyone out there has any more information about the pair of them, do let me know. And uh, thank you. Thank you for watching.